it's good for us yeah and maybe some good ideas yeah because okay. yes you just said uh procrastination and like having having a sense of urgency to act in the world but perhaps uh no clarity on the particular task right now and you uh and yes and and so so there's this idea of let's say you mentioned your flute and this is your practice this is your daily kind of um you meditate through sound and and you know like um you receive whatever comes to you and, and meditate on it and it's the, there's this idea um in heidegger i posted this quote heidegger quote about because you talked about metaphor and metaphor is this kind of there's there's an ambiguity of meaning within metaphor right and it's heidegger said like in this time not right now when the gods had fled from the west yeah the gods have fled and we are just like worked up in our rational protocols and we're very kind of unhappy in this all and uh, something's missing and the, the gods are missing uh, from our experience day-to-day -day experience of reality and he says interestingly uh you know many criticisms of his philosophy was like so what what's your solution what's like okay so there's nihilism there's the crisis you know we all were organized over rationalized but so what are you going to do about it what do you suggest and he's like well this is the problem you can't really always expect a solution you must be like you must develop an attitude of attentive waiting he said which is basically uh, when you're talking about your 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 practice is like when you work when you write when you whatever you do uh, when you're an artist let's say and you you always attend every day you attend to what you what you do and every now and then there's this muse coming and and something amazing happens right but you always need to be in this receptive mode of okay well if it comes to me i'm ready i'm tuned in like i i will resonate if the inspiration comes i will be there i think that's the kind of mix we we're always suspended between this kind of receptivity to something that will be worth exploring and at the same time taking the action without having a guarantee anything will come yeah like so is this meandering between uh, you know a receptivity and activity which is not fully like boom it has to be this is the target this is the result we need to be kind of in between now yes and it's it's nice that you mention heidegger because i love heidegger uh, kirkler and all these guys as well and i feel it's that sometimes we're either focusing on a solution or a problem that maybe we have created it's about where do we put attention to and as you were talking of course i also put it into context we have been separated from the gods but also the goddess for like five thousand years according to anthropologists and and spiritual beings and astrologers so i follow for instance heather Entworth, very insightful i think i shared something about it and and she said in a way this is that masculine thing we think ah there's a problem we need to fix it we need to solve it but the divine masculine uh, feminine is actually not looking at the problem the divine feminine is looking how can i have a new relationship how can i approach something new so i feel what you're saying is very important because that stops us we want to have a guarantee of the outcome you know we want it all so clear but really wondering on this chakana in the different worlds playing the flute which is also ambiguous because of course it's a metaphor i'm not physically walking on the chakana and the chakana is also a metaphor of the southern cross which is one of my favorite star systems so it's much more than that than just walking and playing and maybe it is not and this is the procrastination we are so used to bring then clear goals clear results clear outcomes knowing what we're doing but maybe it's not that maybe it's just putting that energy into it and allowing it to flow 
find our rhythm and find that relationship rather than trying to cut it all and say, this needs to come out, this is the result. And maybe this is our procrastination. We are kind of meandering and we're caught between letting it flow and trying to fulfill in a time like that some goals or some specific things when maybe it's just about beginning something new and l letting it go. Right. I feel also that that is a metaphor that birthing, of course, we don't know anything about birthing physically, but men are also birthing a new world because we are also creating new ideas, new practices, new ways of being. And as you said, it comes from that state of meditation. And, and also, of course, what Heidegger says, it comes from that attentive state. Now, for me, one of the biggest masters of all is, is Ramana Maharashi. He's an Advaita guy, non-duality, died almost when he was 17, created his own ashram. He was the guy who started the Who Am I? inquiry in meditation. And he says, it's not about how many hours you meditate. It's about how you bring that consciousness of the I am into your presence. This is the attention. Yeah, how attentive I am to that presence. My own, which is not the ego, the persona, but that infinite space of isness. How do I do that? And I feel right now we're getting caught up in that. And of course, then comes the dialogue. And dialogue, of course, beautiful dialectical dialogue was Kirkler. I, I had the book, I read it, but I don't have it anymore. He was Kirkler or Kotler? No, Kotler. Kotler? Kotler. He's also a German guy, and I had the book Dialectical dialectical dialogue or something like that oh, i don't know what well, which what kind of time 19th century or like yeah, yeah 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 last yeah yeah last no he was in the no no last century last, last century, century 20th so i don't have everything in my mind but he refers a lot to heidegger as well all right and about how dialogue needs to be in the flow now this right. is right i'm sorry no, no, no. And this is what we're talking about. We are struggling between letting it flow and wanting it like that. Right. Think Because I'm thinking about it like we do need both, don't we? Because when you manifest, you must have a clear, precise idea and visualize the success and imagine it as if it has been achieved already so it needs to be precise so like there's a vision there's a there's there's a specific vision we want to achieve and if we put we feed that attention it will be achieved um but then on a day-to-day moment-to-moment basis we are bound to just do the meandering bit and kind of listen to our mood listen to the mood of the day and and see when we deserve a bit of rest and when we are in good mood to 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 be productive or you know like it's like it's like this um like work-life balance in a way as well when you're your own boss it's much harder isn't it you need to really listen to the body to your mind to to feel the energy of the time, to, to use it in the right way. Like, when is it good to go to the beach? When is it good to stay an hour longer on the task? And, uh, you know, Simon Sinek, uh, a great, he, like, he's, you know, the kind of uh, business, business kind of leadership uh, personality. And he, he says, it's not like, like work-life balance. It's to kind of develop this sensitivity to know, to seamlessly move from one to the other so work isn't a chore anymore and uh, leisure is not like you know indulgence beyond necessity 
you know, it, that's, that is the balance and that is the, the golden mean, really, where sometimes we have these days, don't we, when we kind of yeah. feel... I don't want to do was, anything. Sorry? I don't want to do anything. I uh, know, but I mean, like, the days when we felt like we've been just enough productive and we gave ourselves time and we're like, oh, I've done well today, haven't I? Because I've connected with this person, I ticked this, this couple of tasks off, I read a bit of book, it's like, I feel accomplished after this little day and you can be grateful in that moment yeah so yeah. but the dialogue again uh, i think what dialogue does is it catalyzes the flow in fact if if we resonate if 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 we as we as you and i happen to do you know we uh, a dialogue doesn't give you the time. Like when you write, you have to think, and it's easy to overthink. You write, like you're thinking because you're writing and you're reflecting on what you write. But when you speak, uh, there's less time, I find. So for me, it's much easier to do, um, to be spontaneous, like this, obviously, and and it's much easier to get into the flow uh, with with um, yeah with people discussing topics that are somewhat challenging but at the same time um you know you can feel expert at or comfortable within within the field while happy exploring new new angles yes i call that sometimes the the magic of the unexpected when we are not fixed on the outcome but when we say, okay, we go in this direction, we have a general map, but we are willing to see what's on the way inside and outside. And that goes a little bit what you said about leadership, that you're kind of flowing a little bit more and you recognize what's on the outside. What am I supposed to achieve? But what's on the inside? And what is the, the magic of the unexpected, of the spontaneous? If I'm so focused and I want to convince in a discussion or I want to be right in a debate, there's no space for the unexpected and the spontaneous. And this, this for me is, is also the magic of dialogue, the unexpected, you have that room. You also have the room to be vulnerable so as you said, we have our expertise, we have our inner knowing, our mental knowing, we have all of that. But the magic is really that comes out in the dialogue. We talk about things maybe nobody has ever touched and we haven't touched. So we go really into a space of vulnerability, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is, again, for me, that's where the magic happens. It's interesting, the manifesting has become a totally new meaning for me. I, yeah, I don't follow particular things in manifesting, but of course we're all manifesting and I feel it's a time for manifesting. But I listened to an interview with um, Zach Bush, maybe a, a year ago, I don't know if you're familiar, with a medical doctor, very interested in the earth, and he interviewed a hundred year old doctor, a lady, McCleary, I was using her quote somewhere. But what is interesting, she said this is also a time of femifesting. She, metaphors, they have ambiguous meaning. Manifest comes from the masculine, man. Um, okay. And femifest, she says, is the, 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 the feminine way, the divine feminine way to create and to manifest. And now imagine we could do both then we're not separated from the gods anymore. I feel, and this is also what, what I feel when you I come back to Heidegger again, because I love him and, and I know about this. I think we, we are really learning not to be separated anymore from self, but also from the gods and the goddesses and the universe and the earth. We don't have really relationship. We have destroyed the earth, but we don't have a relationship. The feminine isn't afraid of death because she knows it's just a cycle. It just keeps on going. And rebirthing is as important as living and birthing and dying. Not only as a human, as everything. This is the 
the change that is always there in that world. So I feel for me, the dialogue just takes us to totally different places. Because I don't need to prove you right or wrong. I don't need to convince you of everything. My mind is open and so is my heart. I don't need you to agree. Yeah, that's, that is beautiful. And I remember when you brought this up in one of your posts and I responded to it because um, there's a guy I really respect. I post um, his content all the time, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and he did mention that, which really opened my eyes, which should be obvious, but wasn't until, you know, hadn't been until that, until that moment when he said, it's when we try to facilitate the dialogue, we're not talking about debate, right? Like you said, debate is one or the other wins. You're already in a game theoretical environment. I win through your fall or vice versa. Like this is abolished. Like this dynamic has no currency anymore. No. So what we need instead is a dialectic, right? Because dialectic is you take two or more points of view, you mix them together, you, you, you come across contradictions, let's say we disagree or we have different visions, but through curiosity and through provided we come in good faith, right? And we don't want to play tricks to undermine the other, that will be debating, but we are, we coming, um, we, 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 we're entering the, this relating relationship, a dialogical relationship that means we are interested in exploring and learning from each other and finding out where we might correct our own beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. And through the synthesis of these two or more points of view or angles, we can arrive at a more refined, synth synthesized um, vision, you know, like a view of things, So, which is most exciting of all, right? As long as we can trust each other's good faith in the dialogue to be genuine, then is the best environment for, you know, improving. Yeah, that, because dialectic is, you know, since since uh, Socrates and Plato, you know, dialectic is to ascend, is to is to use your reason in a way that is not only reaching knowledge but wisdom. Yes. So we are actually ascending to wisdom through dialogue and not the debate. Ahead the promises, the practical wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this dialectical dance, I feel, can only happen in a dialogue because I'm not attached to my position. I allow that a synthesis can occur in whatever way. And this is also for me magic because the synthesis is this moment of bliss or the aesthetic moment, as, as Bachtin called it. It just occurs. This synthesis is a very natural way that brings ascens and ascendance and transcendence together because then it's really about the wisdom, the Sophia or the, the phronesis that is coming out. It's not about Adam and Patrick, no. Mm -hmm. Right, transcending so, ego, egotistic exactly. a relationship to your, to your own beliefs, right? Exactly. And, and this is where more wisdom comes out and where it also becomes practical. Because still, when we have a synthesis out of these dialectics, it doesn't mean that you and I take exactly the same. It means we have brought it together and we have now evolved in our own ways. Maybe we are more similar and maybe we have more things in common, but it doesn't mean that you and I are identical now. Absolutely not. And added to it, you know what I've been thinking about a lot in these communication technologies that have emerged, obviously, you know, like first it was the internet, let's say, so people can communicate like across, you know, around the world. But then we had, let's say, YouTube, when spoken 
language, not only written, like the written language was the, um, uh, you know, the, the printing press. So that was the big deal. That's changed the whole world. But now we have YouTube, which is, uh, I think Jordan Peterson mentioned that it makes spoken word, democratized spoken word. But now what we have, look at that. Through COVID and the Zoom, this kind of this formula of, of meeting people, it's become normal. Now I'm speaking to you. This morning I spoke to Karen, you know, the Dr. Karen Johnson. So we had a meeting as well. I have other people scheduled as well. And it's like, what we're doing, we have these exponentially growing technologies with which proliferate um, in, in a network manner. And we have these spontaneous chats, spontaneous dialogues going on. Then you upload it onto a public domain. And this synthesis expands exponentially. Right? Isn't that fantastic? That we, that is the first time in history of humanity we actually and and also there's this element, this dimension of intimacy, because many of us found each other through this uh, context of being some somewhat uh, outcasts of of the parrot of the co collapsing paradigm, right? And self self uh, kind of. Uh, expelled, self-expelled from 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 the from the world of things not working very well and being increasingly creaky. It's like uh, I'd rather kind of find like-minded individuals around the planet, and yes. and we do that. And this is real. This is not uh, a hippie mumbo jumbo, right? Like now, it's it's just evident that we don't really care about, like I said, our beliefs, our particular biases or whatever, there's something much more fundamental, uh, which is our priority, that is to connect and to learn and to be eager to find another point of view and see where, how it could inform my own, et cetera, et cetera, and then make it spread and let people discover it and influence us and reach out. And then we can, we can, we can build some kind of um, communities. Um, yes. in this way yeah i feel this is where it's going and in a way it's going beyond influence it's more like we're planting seeds we're coming together to share what comes out of our dialogue to inspire others to give them their own synthesis ah they say this for me that means that it's not like we're giving them a formula now because we are so wise and we created this wisdom. Now you need to do the same. But the people who are coming to us, as you said, in that new community, a global community, are like minded. They are also out of the breaking systems and paradigms. And like you, they are here to create new things. So we inspire each other and we're being catalysts for each other to do that in our fields. And we help others to see that, wow, I can do what they are talking about. They talk about philosophy and education and dialogue and how to do things different in their fields. Wow, I can do that maybe in mine. How does that translate? And this is now not influence anymore. Now you have become a seed that somebody else takes to grow wherever they are. And of course, this is the idea of a community because we're not all the same. And, you know, I'm not very good at farming. I plant a bit, but I'm not very good at it. But I'm good at having these conversations and, and being a catalyst and weaving together with you, different levels of knowledge and wisdom into this emerging time and the opportunities that are here. And the opportunities are here now. We can manifest and femifest something new. And each spark, each light is important. It's beautiful. Right. Yes, it is. It is rather fascinating because it's, 
like you said, we inspire one another. And I almost feel like um, like a sense of like a sense of uh, culpability because I have received so much inspiration from random people who uploaded the content, which mm -hmm. I had never known before, like about, you know, like over the last two, two and a half years, like we, used, we had to stay in so much or like support ourselves with like, you know, these, these kind of sparkles of online activity and, and, and maybe uh, vicariously co consuming content, which isn't meaningless to we're tr really trying to find something that's meaningful and, and of value. And we, we, we do discover amazing individuals. So then it does make you feel like, well, maybe, maybe I could kind of do it. And, and in a way, many of us now are in this situation where we have to uh, make ourselves visible. So, so we can continue with, uh, out, uh, to be as independent as possible from those structures we, ha we have left, yes. from those old structures. So, so it's almost like catalyzed our presence in the world mm -hmm. and catalyzed our uh, connect connectivity with each other and catalyzed um, some goodwill to, you know, like, yes, contribute to, to this whole process, right? Yes in the best way we can to be part of this new creation that is emerging and you know it, it's not like everybody doesn't have the money to make something and buy everything not everybody has physical abilities not everybody has whatever but if we're bringing it together then we start really collaborating mm -hmm. And, and again, for me, collaboration happens in a dialogue because I really make space for one another. Mm -hmm. And I allow everyone to take what they need in order to do their thing. You don't only need farmers and, and um, teachers in a new world. No, you need all different kind of professions. You need all different kind of businesses. But imagine we have the same kind of DNA we have the same gold print that we're operating from. It, it kind of opens up a space for us, maybe to be in the integrity and in the authenticity we could have not imagined prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel for that, of course, the technology is crucial. I mean, if we, you and I, the chances that you and I meet between Malta and, and Peru, unless we're teleporting, is very very little at the moment because you are most likely not leaving Malta and I'm most likely not leaving Peru right now. But it gives us here an opportunity to to be part of this new thing that's emerging and to inspire that to all the community that has chosen to be outside of the old falling structure. This, this is fascinating. And as you said, I mean, I read sometimes posts and I go like, wow, that wasn't that wasn't here five years ago, you know, and it's not negative and it's not criticizing. It's not judgmental that the really nice posts for me. This is really the ones who are here to create the new. And, and they're emerging now. And I also talked to a beautiful lady in, in Canada, Robin. In the beginning, she was banned from LinkedIn and all of these things because she said the wrong things, you know. And now she has left this anger that she had and now she posts about what can we do? Productive stuff, yeah. <laughs> so I feel, yeah, these last two and a half years now, they have really given us that opportunity. So there is a blessing in it all. Sometimes we need to be pushed to make a choice to open up a new horizon, right? And mm -hmm. this is exactly what happened. And I feel having the courage to use our inner knowledge, inner wisdom together with our mind to connect with like-minded, to create that dialogue that makes a change. Maybe five years ago, there was no need for us to actually have a dialogue. Still in the training phase then. 
right? We are still learning, right? <laughs> well, we're always learning, but I think also uh, I like to refer to this, um, to the training that is uh, going within and non-reactive non presencing in the world. Like, yeah, writing a post that is, let's say, bordering on the judgmental law. Because now, look, we have these algorithms which will censor us or down, you know, grade our reach or whatever it may be, which is actually a gift yes. for for us to become more articulate, mm -hmm. less, le well, to be as cutting and as lucid without being confrontational, which is pretty, um, which is the best that can be, right? If you want to be present and authentic, that means you need to catalyze out. So these machines, they these machines will grab onto new and new that will improve, and we will have to cognitively improve with them to be to stay on top. So it, there's a new demand made on our cognition in language. See, and that's that's very important for me because it's also like a natural selection. You don't need a million people watching us or reading our post we don't mm -hmm. you know, we are so focused on the numbers but maybe more than half of them they don't read anyway or they are not for that message so mm -hmm. we, i feel it's it's really important that we craft our message in a way that it reaches those who need to be reached and if some are not reached it's also good but still as you said the creativity or the creativeness, especially with language, is actually being, how should I say that? It has, it has grown in a way because mm -hmm. we need to find a way to dance or hack or hack it, you know, well, to dance between the, the traps yeah, right? without, without losing our integrity, without losing our truth. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I don't mind. This Okay, for some people, this is very annoying. And of course, you could call that negative or whatever. But at the same time, what a beautiful opportunity. Mm -hmm. I feel for us, it is also the discipline to stay positive. To stay clear, we're actually here to create something new. If I curse something old or if i make something old really bad and talk against something that doesn't really serve as mother teresa said you know don't invite me for a demonstration against war invite me for a demonstration for for, for peace yeah so yeah. i don't want to focus on something that is anyway broken i think we need to focus on what we can do together and and this this is the opportunity yeah it really challenges us and i love it yes it does and it's every challenge if received you know with with gratitude is an opportunity right so yeah it's like it's like an assignment isn't it when you're learning how to write an essay you have to just do what they tell you it's not like you have great ideas, that's fine. But first you need to learn how to structure your answer, how to structure your, or how to articulate in a particular way. So as frustrating as it is, it's an assignment and we can evolve through this process. Yeah. I used to teach study skills and I started a group called Study Buddies. I was very fascinated about analyzing, but more than analyzing, the question and the ticks you need to make on the way in order to receive a good mark. I said, it's not really being super intelligent. It's about knowing what is required. But in that, you still have a lot of freedom. You just need to be clear how to tick the box. It's yeah. not all that bad, but it, it can be also very interesting. Of course, my assignments were much more open because I was more interested in what are they really 
sensing what they're really experiencing what what is their take on it but in general assignments are very clear again and that was for me always a challenge because my moderators didn't always like my way of assignments but I got them through too because I knew how All right and this is a little bit I, I like that you brought that in because this is a little bit what's happening right now and it is just like that but we have chosen to be here at this time <laughs> so in a way we know what to do we have been prepared mm. so it's about remembering a lot that we actually know how to how to write this as i called my book you know riding the wave into the heart mm. this is really how how we are managing this new wave coming on you know and being accepting of whatever is happening something is ending and something new is beginning it's just as simple as that yeah it's a lot of fun adam actually yeah yeah it's great uh, and it's kind of amorphous but at the same time you can you can feel in the sense of it crystallizing into into um, and an ever less chaotic uh, shape because as it goes through time, like we collaborate and actually um, there's a lady Eva Molnar, she's from Texas and and uh, I speak with her. She's a sophrologist on a regular basis. She suggested we we do like a Zoom call collectively, you know, maybe. Maybe we just, if all of us who are already some of us with each other and, you know, and we, we have a Zoom call and we can do breakout rooms and kind of real time, you know, that would be another step, I guess, right? Definitely. I'm open for that. It's just the time zones, I guess. Because <laughs> well, we we're all manage. over the shop. Sorry? Yeah, but I think we can manage. It's possible. It is possible. Yeah, yeah, like most yeah, of continents, but yeah. uh, I think yeah, if if it's just Amer Americas and Europe, not too bad. But if someone's like Australia or New Zealand, that becomes complicated. Yes, yeah. but still, but you could have two calls where you have Australia, New Zealand with Europe, or from here because I talk a lot to Australia, New Zealand. It's in my afternoons when they have their morning. This is good for me, but of course. That is then your night. Right. <laughs> no, my, my afternoon is already your night. So, but it's, it's possible. It's, it's night, like every fortnight or every three weeks or something, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. You can sacrifice. I think right. it would be worthwhile, wouldn't it? To do something like an event. Yes. And exchange ideas in, in real time. Maybe, maybe create some kind of structure to it and, and facilitate it. Yeah, and have and have maybe particular topics that you want to explore. Mm. You know, yeah, a little bit of structure and topics I think will be necessary for that. Yeah, so we are creating new things and we're not procrastinating. We're not. No, we're <laughs> manifesting and manifesting. <laughs> exactly. And I, yeah. See, this is it. It's like oh. always just to just to push it a notch further. Yeah, that's. That's the, that's the purpose, like, and follow your curiosity and follow the uh, spontaneous drive towards the new. And, and follow your heart, you know. Mm. If the heart and the mind are in a battle, then usually that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. When they are all together synced, it's also another dialectics in a way. When the body and the all of it basically, the heart and the mind are together, then you have a synthesis too, and you have a moment of bliss, mm. and things are flowing very easily. If your heart says no, 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 I don't want that, then the mind is not going much further. But when you bring it really all together. It was interesting. We went to a little bit community service and we went to a local school here to a village we didn't know. Very beautiful. One of the teachers that we know here invited us. 
and we spoke about emotional intelligence from a different perspective. Where does it happen? Where does it come from? What is it? And how can you use it? And we brought the metaphor, because I love metaphors, of compass in. And I asked, so what's the compass? And one guy answered straight away, the heart. But this is interesting. He was very spontaneous, and but it's true. If the compass of our interactions, of our dialogue, of all that we do and who we are is the heart, then the mind actually, I would almost say, becomes exponential. Because the limitations of the if and why and fear, they kind of go because the heart doesn't know that. Mm. The heart is considerate and compassionate and loving and kind, is in its truth and integrity. But the mind is the one that's domesticated. No, you can't do this. Uh, this is dangerous. I can't control if I do that, but the heart doesn't have that. So for me, this is quite nice to have the heart as the compass. And as I said, I believe my mind is much more free since I consciously embody my heart as my compass. Mm. Yeah. I, when you, I think that for me, the, um, the decisive step was what Robin brings up time and again is stepping out of fear. When you actually, when you actually make a conscious decision, like, I take the ultimate responsibility to not be controlled by my own fear. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes a long time to actually investigate it and, and struggle through the implications of what it means. But when you actually start, I remember that very clearly because that was in the, in the last organization before I, before I actually left. But I already, I decided to just be what I am and how I, how I am and, and, and be, be just 100% myself and take any uh, consequence that comes with it as a result. And that the liberation of stepping out of that fear and, and the, it was just a beautiful liberating experience to, to simply be, be, there was so, so much joy. And at the same time, I was, teaching and as that was my job and the lesson were just amazing like the topics like there's no fear of like what topics of course i can do any topic you know we live in a free country you can do any topic you know and it's like all these topics are like oh yeah but what if like company policy this or if someone reports it's like all of that's gone and and that is essentially what you're talking about i feel that that, that you let the heart to be the compass and yeah. and because because as long as you you show there is no ill will in this yes. activity because people will be offended people will be triggered people you know but you know that you've weighed you've weighed the rational arguments you've weighed the you know the good and the bad and and overall you with all the best of your knowledge and responsibility and a sense of, you know, like co common sense, you arrived at the place that, you know, the decision that out of fear, that the, the total outcome will be best, despite the bad stuff that might happen. And that really relieves you and, and the blessings flow from that yeah. moment. And blessings just flow because you, act, you are acting authentically in the world. Which is become which is very rare, and then people really recognize like, whoa, you know, my colleagues are probably, why is your life so amazing? Like, what's like? I know I'm just doing my regular day. It's nothing amazing. I'm just it's my job, isn't it? You know, but it actually feels amazing because you don't feel confined in any way, okay. right? And I I am very clear. People feel if you're authentic, if you're coming from the heart, you're coming from the truth with S at the end, not singular, and you're coming from love. And not as a feeling, you're coming for 
the best for all. You're not coming to judge someone, to hurt someone, to harm someone, but you come for a, for a, for making space for everyone. Mm. And this is liberating because then you get away with many things that other people don't. And you have the happiness because whatever you create, whatever you do, whoever you are, your presence is actually true. Mm. And people feel it if it comes from love, not from the emotion of love, blah, blah. No, yeah. they feel that. And this is the heart. From care, from care. Yeah. Exactly. You come from genuinely caring. And there's a sensitivity in that. I'm not here to harm you, to hurt you, to upset you. I'm here to create, to explore, to make more space for you. And if you don't need all this space or whatever you're getting out of it, beautiful. And that makes the happiness because we're also not attached to the expectations of mm -hmm. self or others. Mm -hmm. so the relationship the space of, of the heart that we're creating doesn't have expectations and people feel that again. Mm. So it's, it's a wonderful time when we really recognize that and when we shift from the fear. It doesn't mean that they are not situations that we should be aware of. I mean, I'm not fighting with a crocodile who needs some food. Of course not, you know. But most fear that exists in the mind, actually, as we just said, doesn't really exist. And when we have a comp our compass in the heart, then we realize that and we liberate that. At the same time, and, and this is what I mean by this kindness and, and lovingness that we bring into it, it doesn't mean we don't understand those who live in fear. Because as long as you live here in the fear, this is real for you. you uh, this is when people ask you, how come you be so happy and you do and you are so amazing in your life? Yeah, well, because you have transcended that fear. But it doesn't mean that those who live in fear don't have that reality. You know, mm -hmm. so there comes also the compassion. I understand because me too, I lived in this fear. So, yeah, I feel that is also very, very important that we have that compassion just because we have been able to transcend it and we, we make the heart our compass to liberate our minds <laughs> in a way. It doesn't mean I don't have compassion. This is also the heart. I have compassion for those who are not there because it's their reality. It's just not mine. Right, and even I think ultimately to those who misjudge you and and um, vilify you, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because someone may be a subject to a, a kind of conditioning. Yes, where transcendence is not even amongst options because the the programming goes deep enough to to prevent one from breaking out. Exactly, and I feel well, there's no agency. No. And I feel it's very important to appreciate that. It's not about starting a war mm. or feeling superior. It's about really understanding where people are at. And as you said, the conditioning is very strong. And, and you know, people feel this is their way of security. And we have been trained. Domestication comes out of Miguel Ruiz and his sons domestication, how we have been trained to think and what to believe and the programming, what you're mentioning now, this is what makes us believe we need this level of security. And when we realize we don't, well, it's very liberating, but it doesn't mean that everybody is going to experience it. And those who don't experience it and who don't go there are any less than we are. It's not that it's just their choice. It's their experience. Patrick, I have to go because I have a meeting in five minutes, but uh, it, it was an amazing meeting. Yes, and thank you so much. We'll do it again. I will send yes. you the recording. Yeah? Yes, please do. I think we're going to share it. Great. Right. Yeah, we should. Thanks very much. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.